This program is made possible by the Archdiocese of New Orleans, the Catholic Cultural Heritage Center, the Catholic Foundation of Greater New Orleans, Catholic Journeys, and the Willwoods community. Greetings and God's blessings to all of you. It is a privilege for us to be here today to be able to talk about saints, ordinary people with extraordinary gifts. They serve as a model to us so that we can imitate them. They serve as mentors to us, giving us examples of how to live, and they can inspire us in our daily lives. We ask the saints to pray with us and to pray for us to God, because it's always God who answers our prayers, gives us what we need, comforts and consoles us in life. But we believe that the prayers of the saints and their walking with us can indeed be an important dimension of our coming to know the Lord Jesus. And so we do have the opportunity to look at specific lives of women and men as we walk with them, as we see their road to sainthood. They are names whispered in prayers, said softly in times of anguish, people long gone, but long remembered for their devotion to God. In early church history, saints were named by local bishops. After the 11th century, that power was given solely to the Pope, and more recently, steps were added to the process. If a person is found worthy of consideration, they're called servant of God. If it's decided they lived a life of heroic virtue, they're declared venerable. Once a miracle is credited to their intercession, they are beatified and called blessed. And a second miracle is needed before they can be given the title saint. This road has taken these seven to and through New Orleans. The teenager who gave comfort during the French Revolution. The nun who was never allowed to wear a habit. The priest who challenged Lincoln. The multi-million dollar heiress turned nun the sister who missed the boat giving up her ticket to tragedy, the Irish widow who faced down a Civil War general, the housewife who lost her family but found her faith, seven people who gave their lives to God and lived their lives for others, ordinary people given extraordinary gifts, and this is their road to sainthood. In the 17 and 1800s, America called out to those looking for a new start, a new way of life, a second chance. Most everyone was from someplace else, and many of those who claimed native status had never heard of Jesus or Christianity. Here you are on untamed, wild territory. The entire United States is considered a mission field by Rome. So they are sending priests here. They are sending sisters here to help catechize to people that had not known and also to evangelize within this great mission field. The United States remains a mission field until like 1906. They crossed the ocean, crossed the country, crossed cultures. Fulfilling the Great Commission started some on the road to sainthood, a winding path that for these special seven led to and through New Orleans. The French Revolution stopped 18-year-old Rose Philippine Duchesne from taking her vows. The teenager with dreams of becoming a nun and a missionary was living in a convent in 1788. But outside those walls, France was turning upside down. So her father let her stay there for a while. And then eventually, when it looked like the French Revolution was going to actually take place, he went over and brought her home. And then shortly afterwards, the convent was closed, the nuns dispersed, and the priests imprisoned. Philippine lived her religious life outside of the convent, caring for the sick and poor and the religious who were being persecuted. After the revolution, a meeting with the young foundress of the Society of the Sacred Heart, Madeline Sophie Barat, would give her a new direction. 
the mission of educating and teaching the love of Jesus to young girls. In that time, women really did take care of the family. They raised the children. So both of these women, and particularly uh, Philippine, realized that if you educate a child, a girl child, then you're educating the whole family. They opened a convent, a school. Philippine became mistress of novices. Meantime, across the ocean in New Orleans, things were happening that would drastically change Philippine Duchenne's life. The War of 1812 had ended. The new country and the new world was moving forward, as was the church. It's, it's a while before we get a bishop, but after the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans 1815, Duberg becomes the bishop of this territory um, and, and of the diocese. He doesn't have enough priests and sisters. So oftentimes, all of the bishops of, bishops of the United States at the time would go to Europe and recruit. Duborg made his way to Paris and knocked on the door of the Society of the Sacred Heart. St. Philippine was there. She, I answered the door. And on hearing all of this, she basically fell on her knees in front of St. Madeline Sophie and begged her to let her come to the New World and fulfill the goal of her life, which was to educate Native Americans. In 1818, Philippine Duchenne and four other nuns boarded a ship to the New World. It was a grueling 10-week voyage. Along the way, they encountered either storms or the doldrums. They even had pirates board the ship. They had fires on board. They had a lack of food. Casks of wine broke open. At one point, they thought they were bad luck, and they really wanted to throw them overboard. They spent 70 days at sea, and by the time they got to the city, Bishop Dubourg had already gone to St. Louis. So they arrived at the, at, in New Orleans and were brought immediately to actually the priest's house because it was the middle of the night and waited until the Angelus rung at six o'clock in the morning, at which time they were taken to the old Ursuline convent. And the Ursulines welcomed them with open arms. They were so happy to see them. The Ursulines took them in, even encouraged them to stay in New Orleans. But at the age of 49, Philippine was finally closing in on her dream, bringing the love of Jesus to Native Americans. For weeks, they waited for word from Duborg. But the mail was slow in coming and they hadn't heard anything, so the, uh, the Ursuline sisters really paid for the passage to travel up the river and to begin what they thought was the school that they were gonna open in St. Louis. But the bishop had changed their mission. They would be living in an empty log cabin teaching local children in the tiny Missouri town of St. Charles. Duchenne wrote that it was the remotest village in the United States. She was living a real pioneer life, a very um, hard, as far as resources go, you know, her environment was very tough, lack of food, lack of warmth even lack of pupils. Her mission was now different from her dream. But if she felt disappointment, she never let on. She just carried on and on, opening Catholic schools in Missouri and beyond. The society was contacted by a woman in the Opelousas, Louisiana area, primarily in the Grand Coteau area. And she offered the sisters land if they would come and open a school there. Eventually, Duchesne and her sisters opened six schools in Louisiana, including the Academy of the Sacred Heart in New Orleans. The society had grown in schools, students, and sisters, but the years of poverty and harsh conditions took their toll on Duchesne. She gave all to others, and even as she grew old, she chose to live in a small closet under the stairs at the house in Missouri, room enough only for a bedroll. Her dream of reaching out to Native Americans was fading with her. When, as she turned 70, a Jesuit priest chose three younger nuns to help with the tribe in Kansas. And she was sitting in a chair, listening, and tears were rolling down her cheeks, just with the realization that she would never be able to realize her dream to, to work with them. 
And the priest noticed that and said, she will go. She will go if we have to carry her. She finally got to go. But having never really mastered English and unable to pick up the Native American language, she spent her days playing with the children and praying, always praying. So they would watch her and they would sneak up and put leaves sometimes on the back of her habit as she knelt in prayer in the evening. And then they would come back in the morning and the leaves would still be there. So they named her Kwakukotomi, which means the woman who prays always. In eight months, too ill to continue, she returned to the sisters in St. Charles, Missouri. She died in 1852, leaving schools, convents, and a legacy of Sacred Heart education behind. After the miraculous healing of a nun was attributed to her intercession, in 1988, Philippine Duchenne was declared a saint. The school St. Philippine started in Grand Coteau would soon call to another woman on the road to sainthood, and it would be a rocky road for Cornelia Connolly. Cornelia's life is a soap opera. Um, you, someone could write this as a novel, and no one would believe the story. They would say, that can't possibly have happened. In 1831, Cornelia went against her Philadelphia family's wishes and married a handsome Episcopalian priest, Pierce Connolly. The couple soon moved away to Natchez, Mississippi. He was running a church, she was having children. Then things started to change around her. It's a real time of anti-Catholicism. He begins to start studying, why does everybody hate the Catholics? And he starts asking himself questions about what is the Catholic religion about? And he comes to the conclusion that maybe the Catholic religion is the right religion. So he decides to leave the Episcopal priesthood and he steps away from his congregation and he tells Cornelia that he wants to become Catholic. And not just Catholic, he wanted to be a priest and he was going to figure out how by going to Rome. Uncertain and afraid of what this would mean to the family, but supportive and leaning on God, Cornelia packed up and they started their journey. Their voyage would begin in New Orleans. As the family spent a few weeks in New Orleans waiting for passage, they were invited to the massive consecration for a new bishop, Bishop Antoine Blanc. During this grand occasion, Pierce got a lot of attention and acceptance. He loved that. But Cornelia loved it all. She'd been studying Catholicism, and the ceremony at the magnificent St. Louis Cathedral so moved her that she decided then and there to convert. So she takes this to heart, and she knows that that's what she really wants to do and wants to be. She receives her first communion in the cathedral. So this is where, for her, all of that takes place, where she knows God, where she becomes Catholic. New Orleans would forever hold a special place in her heart, a heart that was changing. A meeting with the Pope encouraged Pierce to pursue the priesthood, but he was told to take time to study and discern. Cornelia was relieved when the family moved back to the States, to Grand Coteau, where Pierce found work at a boys' school, and Cornelia taught at the Academy of the Sacred Heart set up by Philippine Duchenne. There were more children. Bishop Blanc was even a godparent. Life was settled and happy. But tragedy would soon break their hearts. One of the children falls into, her two-year-old, falls into a vat of boiling sugar. And it's horrible. He'd gone out to play with the dog, and the dog pushes him into the vat of sugar. And he's burned. And for 42 hours, Cornelia holds the baby until he dies. He was buried alongside his baby sister, who had died less than a year earlier. Cornelia was crushed. Her husband wasn't making things any easier. Within months, he told Cornelia, who was pregnant again, that he was definitely going to become a priest. That meant their marriage would be over. Dutifully, she followed him to Rome, where the couple was formally separated as Pierce prepared for priesthood. Cornelia was taken to live in a convent. Pierce still has weekly visits with him. 
The bishops send the children to a uh, boarding school. Even the youngest is no longer with her. And that's really hard for her. She decides that she's then going to become a nun. Encouraged to start her own order, the Society of the Holy Child Jesus, the Pope asked her to settle in England. And yet, her husband would not leave her alone. Pierre still wants to visit with her once a week. The church tells him he can't do that anymore. He began to unravel, angry that he was not moving up in the ranks of the church fast enough and upset over not seeing Cornelia. So he decides to quit the Catholic priesthood and he sues her and he sues her for the children and he kidnaps the children. He sued to get her back. He sued to have a marital relationship back with her and she says no. I can only imagine, she said, you've put me through all of this. I've dedicated my life to God. I know I'm on the right path of what I now need to do. No, I'm not coming back to you. The court, with its 19th century ideals and vision, sided with Pierce, giving Cornelia a choice, go back to him or go to prison. A judgment later suspended, but not before causing devastating scandal. It goes through the court system. It's ugly, it's nasty. The order for years, like 50 years, the order even because of the great scandal of their foundress did not teach their novices about her history. Her devotion to her faith cost her dearly. Except for three brief encounters, she would never see her children again. Her reputation shattered by infamy. But in her religious life, Cornelia found freedom freedom to lean on God and stand up for her beliefs, wanting to give that to other women to empower them with the love of Jesus through education, she got to work setting up convents, orphanages, and schools with day, night, and weekend classes for women who worked in factories. Showing God's love through the motto, actions, not words, the society would eventually reach 14 countries. All mention of her tumultuous life of twists and turns and tragedies was boxed up when she died at the age of 70 in 1879. A sign of the times, her occupation listed on the death certificate, wife of Pierce Connolly, a gentleman. Years later, when they started finally teaching it, that's when the order decided this woman was a saint. 80 years after her death, Cornelia Connolly was declared venerable, a model of heroic virtue and worthy of veneration and imitation. Although Henriette de Lille's great-great-grandmother had been a slave, she was set free on the death of her owner and then worked to buy the freedom of her family. So when Henriette was born, she was free, a free person of color. Her family lived in the French Quarter. They had money and were well-educated. They were all products of the plissage system. She was a free woman of color. In those days, the tradition was they would be matched with uh, other people, especially you know, uh, people, uh, white people who had money, kind of as their escorts or, or you know, uh, consorts, that, that kind of thing, and, and they were expected maybe to give birth. The fair-skinned, French-speaking Henriette was expected to play along become attractive and pleasing to a white man and become his mistress. It was what her mother wanted. Under the Placide situation, a woman like her mother would have taken her to the quadroon balls where she would have danced with very prominent men. Those men at that time period would have decided who wanted to take care of her in a situation that would have been a legal agreement with her mother. That's true because that's the way the people lived during that time and it was acceptable. There was nothing wrong with it as far as they were concerned because this is what was expected of anyone who was a person of color. She did as she was told. Henriette has two children, um, both of them by the same man. And we know that by the death registers because they're registered and, and they, they give a last name, but we, we can't, we don't have any information about him. We assume he was a white man. We assume he was a man of means because he would have had to have taken care of her. Both of those boys died before the age of two. There's no mention of what happened to the father, but Henriette's heart was changing. 
she had a strong and a deep faith, and she had this religious conversion, conversion at the year of 24. And she said that, you know, she believed in God, she hoped in God, she loved and she wanted to live and die for God. Those words would become her lifetime prayer. She is opening um, her heart to something different and to what God wants her to do. Henriette wanted to become a religious, but of course during those days it was unheard of that, you know, an African-American uh, would, or a free woman of color, would even join a religious community. They didn't think that they were worthy of it, or that they were pure enough to become a religious. But Henriette had some secret help. Bishop Blanc of New Orleans, along with a priest, Henriette's confessor at St. Augustine Church, used their influence to secure a place for her with the Sacred Heart Sisters in Convent, Louisiana, a place established by Philippine Duchenne's order a decade earlier. It was really unheard of of, you know, a free woman of color becoming a religious. So she really had to do it secretly. And she did it as by working as a pantry girl in their convent. And while she was there, that's when she was instructed in uh, the religious life. Soon after, Henriette put her faith in action, using what money she had to help the poor and needy. She was a frequent sponsor of weddings and baptisms for free and enslaved people at the cathedral and at St. Augustine. And she soon found friends who helped. She's beginning to have this group of women that are meeting, that are ministering to the elderly and to the poor and to the indigent and to the, the young children. It was just understood to be an organization of pious women. And then it became an association of women. And then in 1842, that's when it was recognized as a religious community. They were the Sisters of the Holy Family. Henriette used her inheritance to buy a home for them. While they were there, they educated the slaves and they took care of the sick and the elderly. And they actually took in four elderly women who had no one to care for them, but she was not gonna let them stay out on the street and die. And so began the first of its kind Catholic home for the elderly in America, later to be called the LaFon Nursing Home. DeLille threw herself into her faith, showing Jesus through her works educating, feeding, clothing, and comforting those around her. She ministered to whatever their needs were. And there were many times when they may have been hungry, and so whatever food they had at the convent, she would share with them. There were times when they just had sugar water because they would give whatever they had to some, a poor person who was very hungry. All the while, she faced the scorn and hatred of others, racism even from those within the faith. Because she was not white, she was not permitted to wear a habit. That was the custom that after you profess your vow, that you would be given a habit and you would be given a religious symbol to wear. She was not allowed to wear a habit, so therefore she chose the dress of the day. And also, she was not allowed to wear a religious symbol or given a cross, so she put a, the rosary around her neck, and so the cross from the rosary became her religious symbol. Strange as it seems, Henriette's family owned a slave. In her family, there was uh, this slave called Betsy, and they had more or less that she inherited her. And it's believed that if you freed those slaves, that they couldn't stay in the city. They had to move out of the city out of, and go into another state. And so it thought that slave probably didn't want to leave and go somewhere else to feel that they may have been abused or just might not have been able to provide for themselves. At age 50, Henriette died. Hard work, poverty, and disease had taken its toll. She freed Betsy in her will. It would be nine more years before the Sisters of the Holy Family were permitted to wear habits. Henriette DeLille was declared venerable in 2010. Her community now looks for a miracle to move her to the next step on the road to sainthood, blessed. They believe in their hearts she is a saint who worked tirelessly to shine the light of Jesus into the lives of both the free and the enslaved in New Orleans. And so she's on this side of the city and she's doing all of this for the African-American community. On the other side of the city is another woman. And that woman was born a year from Henriette. Born a year apart and a half a world away.
Margaret Gaffney would barely remember the rolling hills of Ireland. Her family boarded a ship to America when she was just four, hoping for a better life. The terrible uh, trip, you know, was a, a penance because everybody was so close and it was not clean. There was not enough food, not enough water, crying babies, old people, just a, a whole mixture of misery is what it was. Storms forced the ship off course. They would be lost at sea, starving for six months. After a half a year, their ship finally reached Baltimore. And sadly, within a few years, Margaret's world would rock again. Her parents and her sister died of yellow fever. Her brother lost forever in the confusion. She worked for and lived with neighbors until she married an Irishman named Charles Harry. When they come here to New Orleans because of her husband's health right after they've been married, he's very ill. Um, she has a baby. He goes back to Ireland for health reasons. He dies while he's in Ireland. Her daughter dies shortly thereafter here in the city, and she's left alone. Poor Margaret, I mean, really alone. And she was uneducated and with no friends, and she had to rely I would say really on the grace of God and the gifts that he would send her to survive. She found work in the laundry of the St. Charles Hotel. She's passing an orphanage that's run by um, the Sisters of Charity, and she sees the children, and she wants to help them. And she goes to the sisters and says, how can I help? And they said, we need to eat. Well, you know, we can't house you because we have to eat as well. Margaret had found a cause. She was not going to stand by and let children starve. She decides to buy a cow. And she buys one cow and then she buys a second cow. And she starts providing milk for the children. The sisters allow her to live with them in a very sparse room while she helps with the children. Pretty soon, she had a dairy going with 40 cows, selling milk and butter from a wagon in the streets of the city. A devout Catholic and now a savvy businesswoman, she had a passion to help. And the orphans needed her as yellow fever raged through the city. More and more children were left alone. Margaret understood. A loan to a friend left her with a deed to a bakery, which she whipped into a profit-making enterprise. The illiterate Irish widow was now even advertising. But all of her money goes to the children and to the orphanages and to helping these children have better lives because that's where her heart is. Working side by side with the Sisters of Charity, she was a familiar face and force for good. And they must have been a team, a hot team together because whenever things got tight, they'd say, there's more babies than we can handle. We need a new place. And she'd say, go do it, go do it. And they'd uh, start out on a new project and it would get done. Even war would not deter her fearless devotion to the helpless and hungry. When Union soldiers took over the city and embargoed all trade, she was determined to keep crossing the lines to get flour in and bread out to hungry citizens and soldiers alike, no matter the uniform color. And so she just presented herself to General uh, Beast, they called him Beast Butler, here and uh, at the Custom House, and in no uncertain terms, just told him what she needed, and in her own inimitable way, or as a fighting Irishman, she must have made him understand, because he relented and let her have whatever she needed. She walked away with a pass. She spent her life working and helping and giving. She's forever forgiving the debt, plus giving money. She buys them. She buys the sisters um, and for the orphanages. She buys a stove. She buys clocks. She, I mean, we have these great records of all the things that Margaret is doing for us that the sisters are writing in their annals. Margaret provided this for us. Margaret gave us $2,000. Margaret forgave our bread bill of $2,000 for the year. As the years went on, she sat in a chair outside the door of the bakery, meeting and greeting the grandmotherly figure in the bonnet who, although successful, kept only two dresses, one for every day, one for special occasions. She is considered 
uh, this great woman, great businesswoman, that gave it all away. Then one day in the winter of 1882, she didn't get up for work. The headlines in the paper was that this calamity occurred when Margaret died. And the news spread all over and everybody came to her funeral. The who's who of the pallbearers, the archbishop, you know, is there that says mass, the priest, the mayor, the governor, um, they all recognized this woman for what she was doing. There wasn't enough room at St. Patrick's for everyone who wanted to say goodbye, and they all wanted to say something. So almost immediately, a collection was taken to build a remembrance for this iron-willed widow with a soft heart. It would cost $6,000. Most of the money came in nickels and dimes. And soon, she was there again, sitting in front of the orphanage she had built, wearing the shawl the children had crocheted for her. Engraved on the statue's marble plaque, just her name, Margaret. She was buried in the tomb of her beloved Sisters of Charity, the only layperson afforded that honor. People in New Orleans and others in her hometown of Kerry Gallen in Ireland are hoping the church will take the first step to put the bread lady of New Orleans, Margaret Hawry, on the road to sainthood. The year was 1866. The 47-year-old priest on the train from Detroit knew that New Orleans would be his last stop. He told fellow passengers yellow fever would claim his life in a year. Did he know he had some kind of premonition that he was going to be here for a short amount of time and, and die? And so maybe knowing that, he worked tirelessly in that last year of his life. For Father Francis Xavier Silos, hard work was just the way of life. He didn't know how to live it differently, and his determination and drive all to serve the Lord. As a student in Bavaria, he had heard the stories of redemptorist missionaries and their struggles to serve the German immigrants in the United States, and he wanted to go. He joined the order and in 1843 set sail for America, leaving his family behind. This was a totally different world for him, a different pace, a different way of life. But the most surprising and unsettling, the hatred toward him and his faith. There were so many nativists who had this fear of the foreign-born people coming to our country. And because those foreign-born were many, or mostly Irish and German uh, and Catholic, there was these fears about Catholics and their allegiance to the Pope and so forth. So he wasn't prepared for that. The rejection he felt only fueled his determination. He was beaten, threatened, robbed, but he was a priest and he had a mission. He would preach, teach, counsel, and comfort those around him. He was a breath of fresh air in the confessional, and that's why people waited in lines, sometimes two hours. He understood them and they understood him because he spoke German, French, and English. Hardworking and well-liked, he was serious business, but always found the fun. I think it was Mark Twain who had said, or rather had quipped, that uh, a German joke is no laughing matter. But, but Silos would have proved him wrong because he really was a breath of fresh air. He was uh, extremely humorous. He had a wonderful sense of humor. His effective teaching and caring ways got the attention of the Pope. Silos was put on the short list to be Bishop of Pittsburgh. Father Silos absolutely did not want this. He immediately told his seminarian, start praying, that I would be spared this calamity, I think is how he phrased it. And then he even wrote to the Pope, listing all of his shortcomings. Really, when he was spared that office, he let his seminarians have a day off, which was a very rare thing in his day. Civil war divided the country, claiming the lives of thousands and thousands of young men, always requiring more to take a place on the battlefield. The South started a draft, one that excluded priests and religious. The northern version of the draft offered no such protection. Silos and another priest made their way to Washington to see the president. Unless this sound very unpatriotic, Silos was actually speaking with the conviction that those seminarians could have done more in the war as chaplains. They could do more of a service. 
While Lincoln was respectful and even invited them to come back, he made no promises about the draft. So the priests headed off to see the stern Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. Already irate over draft riots among Irish Catholics in New York, Stanton yelled at them, told them to get their people under control and sent them away. So he says privately after they met with uh, Stanton and they had such a bad experience, he said that if the church had granted feast days or um, for rascals like Stanton, that Stanton deserved to have a whole octave for himself. <laughs> so. While they received no assurances from the White House, the bottom line was most of his seminarians were not drafted. Father Silos was soon traveling the country, an itinerant missionary in 10 states from the Northeast to the Midwest. But his destiny would lie in the South, in post-war New Orleans, where yellow fever would too often rage through the city. The Redemptors will not send priests here unless they volunteer. They don't actively send priests here because of the yellow fever. And Francis Xavier Silos raises his hand and says, I want to go. He took the long train ride south and headed to a trio of churches in the city. St. Alphonsus and St. Mary's, one's for the Irish, the other's for the German. They're across the street from each other. A block or so away is Notre Dame de Bon Secours, which is the French church. So the Redemptorists are ministering to three different ethnic groups, the Germans, the Irish, the French, in three different churches, because at that time period, they didn't go to each other's churches. In that last year of his life, he came down here, and I think New Orleans was probably his most favorite place, mostly because it was European in flavor, but it was so Catholic in its uh, environment, and he felt very much at home here. Popular and in constant demand among the parishioners, his workload grew significantly as summer set in and people started dying. Yellow fever was back. Hundreds, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people. The city at those different times, when you look at census records, the city at any given moment when there's a yellow fever epidemic can lose 25% of the population up to 50% of the population, just wiped out. After months of visiting with the sick and dying, Father Silos and a dozen of his brothers fell ill. Yellow fever would claim his life, but not his spirit, knowing he would soon see his Lord and the family he said goodbye to so long ago at a train station in Germany. Only his father knew that he was actually going to be coming across the Atlantic to our shores. And when it came time for that final farewell, his dad made a gesture that only his son, you know, could realize. And so his dad kind of pointed like that. And, and the son caught the message, and his son you know, knew that his dad was saying, look, the, the next time we meet is going to be in heaven. And then when he did die on October 4th, 1867, almost about six o'clock in the evening, um, the word got around, certainly vocally, even before I think the papers could say it, but they clamored uh, and came to St. Mary's Assumption Church to want to pay their respects, and they had an all-night vigil for him. A hurricane was closing in on the city that early October night. The vigil at St. Mary's Assumption proved to be both comfort and shelter. In 2000, after attributing a miracle to Father Silos, the healing of a worker at the Silos Center, Pope John Paul II declared him blessed. Two other miracles are now under investigation. Either one may soon change his earthly title to saint. Even as a child in Italy, Francesca Cabrini dreamed of being a missionary. There was a river by her home and she would go to the river and uh, pick violets from the river bank and she would make paper boats and fill the paper boats with violets and sail them along the river. And she would say, sail away, little missionaries. One day, while playing that game, she fell in and nearly drowned. From that day onwards, Francesca had a deep fear, a phobia of water. 
and yet it did not stop her from crisscrossing the ocean 25 times. Although told she was too frail to be a nun, Frances Xavier Cabrini eventually started her own order, the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. After several years, she went to the Vatican to get papal approval. She herself uh, wore civilian clothes up until the time she uh, visited the Vatican, uh, where she was told by the, the secretary, um, if, you, if you want to uh, see the Pope, you know, you need to get into a religious habit. So obediently, uh, she designed this very simple habit. Not stiff, not elaborate, even her rosary was carried in a pocket. If she had to wear a habit, it was going to be practical. She goes to the Pope. She goes and visits him at the Vatican. She's told, no, we don't need you. She wants to go to China. She, they don't need her in China. They want her to come to the United States. So he sends her here. She arrived in New York City and uh, did not get a favorable welcome from the Archbishop there, uh, who basically told her, we don't need you here. You can get on the next boat and return home. So out of her pocket, she pulls out a piece of paper. This has been signed by the Holy Father himself, and here I stay. <laughs> With the help of a generous Italian woman, the sisters set up an orphanage and then begged in the streets to feed the children. Mother Cabrini would go back to Europe many times to find more donors and gather more sisters for the growing task in the U.S. She was in Italy when they got the news that terrible things were happening in New Orleans. In 1890, the police chief, David Hennessy, was assassinated outside his home. Apparently when he was dying, his last words were, the Italians did it. And so the, the word went out in the streets and it became like a mob scene where uh, they arrested 13 Italian residents of New Orleans. Eventually they w went on trial uh, and they were acquitted, uh, found not guilty. But. Before they could be released from jail, um, an angry mob of the local citizens stormed the city jail, dragged out 11 Italian prisoners and hung them up on the main street. Mother Cabrini was in Rome at the time and uh, she heard the news and it just devastated her. Um, the newsboys were shouting out the headlines, America kills our people. She decided she had to go to New Orleans and help her people. Once there, Archbishop Francis Janssens told her she was desperately needed. He was concerned that in his diocese, there were few Italian-speaking evangelizers. So he invited Mother Cabrini to spend a few days with him so that she could uh, visit the Italian ghettos in the city and to familiarize herself with the needs of the people. And there were a lot of Italian people there, so many living and working in and out of the city. The French market, as we know, all the grocers, we think about it being French, it was an Italian market. All the vegetables, all of the produce is all being produced by the Italians. She managed to buy a rundown building in the French Quarter and set it up as a school and orphanage. 10 days after it opened, a yellow fever outbreak killed hundreds in the city and immediately filled the school with new orphans. A few years later, she took a wealthy sea captain on a tour of the orphanage. When he noticed that there were three orphans in the one bed surrounded by 50 orphans, his heart was touched and he offered Mother Cabrini $10,000 to find another site. And she turned him down. She said, that's not enough for me to uh, build the house that I have in mind. So he offered her $75,000. Mother Cabrini turned that into the impressive Sacred Heart Orphan Asylum on Esplanade Avenue. There was space, a chapel, and room to grow. But she didn't stay long in any one place, always on the move, checking on established missions and starting more. She's established, what, 34 missions across the United States? And I think Mexico and some of, you know, some of the other areas. And so she's forever traveling. And she sort of 
just hops from one place to the other checking. She's here for a while. Um, she stays. There's a bedroom that, that they have for her that, that has her bed and has her things out at the Cabrini Chapel. They kept her room ready for whenever she came to town. Even after her death, after the orphanage became Cabrini High School, she would have a place among them. But in life, not one to sit still, Cabrini was always on the go, back and forth across the country and the ocean. In fact, one of the few trips she missed turned out to be a blessing. In 1912, she was getting ready to sail from England to America, but was called to France at the last minute. She was unable to use her ticket for the maiden voyage of the Titanic. She would go to nine countries, setting up schools and missions. She would even end up sitting on a couch with a Philadelphia heiress who had started her own religious order. Catherine Drexel appreciated the advice. Mother Cabrini became a U.S. citizen in 1909. The last thing she was doing before she passed away, uh, she was um, wrapping Christmas presents for the local orphans in her room, sitting in her rocking chair, in her bedroom in Chicago. Thinking of others till the end. She never made it to China, but Frances Xavier Cabrini spent her life sharing her faith and showing it through her works. After her death at age 67, the church credited two miracles to her intercession, restoring sight to a blind child and the healing of a terminally ill religious sister. Canonized in 1946, she was the first naturalized U.S. citizen to be declared a saint. It was in all the papers. The Philadelphia heiress was going to be a nun. Catherine Drexel shocked most everyone in the city when she chose religious life over a society life of riches and luxury. She was born into wealth and status in 1858. And although her mother died soon after childbirth, she grew up with her two sisters in a loving, charitable home. Her father and her new stepmother believed their money was to be shared, to do good works, to do God's work. When she was young, her family used to feed the poor from their house, and she saw that. She saw her father open their doors and feed the poor. They traveled the country, the world even, learning about different places and people, and she felt a deep responsibility to help those less fortunate. When her parents died, Catherine and her sisters inherited an enormous amount of money. They would share the interest off of $14 million, about $1,000 a day for each of them. The Drexel sisters continued the family's philanthropic ways, funding schools and missions for Native Americans and African Americans. While on a European tour, she went to the Vatican to look for some help. She went to the Pope and said, you know, I've got all of these uh, missions and I need some missionaries. I need somebody to teach. And she was in her 30s. Her parents had died. She just knew she wanted to take that money, give it to somebody, and then go to a monastery. And instead, the Pope said to her, why don't you become a missionary yourself? Threw her completely. And so, when she decided to trade her frocks for a habit, it was news. The headlines read, Miss Drexel enters a Catholic convent, gives up seven million. She decides she's not gonna get married. She's not gonna be the socialite. Great to the chagrin of Philadelphia society because, oh my God, what happens to all that money? And I'm sure every man and every suitor wanted to get his hands on some of that money. Catherine decided to start her own order with 13 other women. When you read in the Bible, when you hear Jesus say, you know, that whatever you do for the least of these, you do it for me. And she believed that. She said to the sisters, we are going to be sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. Her focus was on Native Americans and African Americans. She used her money to buy land and set up missions and build schools. She was all heart and all business. If a, a priest wrote and said, I have Native American community or an African American community and they need some help, they need a, a place to worship, they need a school, she would give the money to do that. And then she would say, I'll be out to visit. But not everyone was anxious to see Mother Catherine in their neighborhood. While she shied away from the limelight, people knew what she was doing. 
There were bomb threats. The Klan promised whippings followed by tar and feathers. And one school was burned. She began using dummy corporations to get things started. She decided she was going to have Xavier University. She uh, didn't go and buy it herself. She did it uh, with a third party, went and bought the building. Because if people, people knew what Catherine Drexel did, and if they knew she was coming, they would really work hard not to have her have the opportunity. Her dreams of Xavier began with Xavier Prep, an old abandoned university building. She first comes here and she starts a high school, a grammar school and high school. She buys a piece of property. They break the windows. They do all kinds of horrible things during that Jim Crow period. She was not deterred, and many say Xavier was her first miracle. She said that she wanted to have a building, an edifice that was worthy of my students and, and to show that, you know, this was going to be a first class facility and, and we want people to, when they come here, to know that they are loved and cared for and that building said that. And for her, Xavier University was about creating missionaries, creating leaders, not, not uh, religious, but people who would lead, who would have faith. So her thought was, if you start a university, then true leaders will come out and they will change the world. When the day came to dedicate what many consider to be her greatest accomplishment, she was nowhere to be seen. She was watching the grand ceremony from an upper window, unnoticed. She believed praise belonged to God, as did her money. She helped several other schools in the area. They would be feeder schools to the new university and she used Xavier to give her own nuns a college education. To get around the racial laws at the time, Xavier would close at 4 p.m., and then the white sisters could go to class. Their credits then transferred to another university. She was good at getting things done, and she just could not understand racism in God's world. She would simply say that the church, the uh, nation, we're not doing the right things, and we had to do better. We had to do something, and if they wouldn't do it, then this was going to be her purpose in life, but all out of her love for Jesus. She didn't want fame or money or glory. What she had, she gave to others. She allowed a dollar a day for herself. She lived poverty uh, just so strongly, which is, is very unusual for somebody of, of her wealth, but uh, when she said poverty, she meant poverty. She never used like a full sheet of paper. She used the stubs from her checkbook and wrote her notes, her, her spiritual thoughts, all on these little tiny stubs. When she died, all of the money from her father's estate stopped. It was a stipulation in his will that without grandchildren, the money would go to various charities and religious organizations. His daughter's own society because it was formed after his death, was not on the list. Still, she had lived to be 95 years old. We had a difficulty even when, when she was, uh, when her name was brought up for canonization because Catherine Drexel had told us that no sister of the Blessed Sacrament would, never, would ever be a saint. She believed that we, you know, should be humble women. But they decided to move ahead wanting her message to be heard by the world. She was canonized in 2000 after two miracles of restored hearing were credited to her intercession. One of those miracles, a little girl, was there to hear the Pope declare Catherine Drexel a saint. There are saints who walk among us, some on the road, some who've reached the destination, all bringing the light of Jesus with them in words and works. So all of these women and men, Silos included, they live very small lives. I mean, compared to what they, how they could have lived. Um, they don't live grand lives. They're, they're all about service. They're all about service to the community and service to the indigent, service to the illiterate, service to the poor, the sick, the dying, they, they just want to do good in their lives, and they give their lives for that. 
I think there's a certain um, there's a certain spiritual tunnel vision in in saints. I mean, there is a everybody has a, kind of a focus in their life, but it seems to me that saints have a a special charism, a special tunnel vision that nothing is going to deter them from what they believe, what they've prayed about is their mission in life. And many people kind of wonder about uh, you know, well, what what good are saints? The fact that Silos would get canonized does nothing for him. He's already earned his reward, and he is enjoying the you know, eternal glory that we're all striving for. But him being canonized is for our benefit, and where we can see him as worthy of emulation and imitation, veneration, but also intercession. And Silos has a, a remarkable... They are examples, encouragement, inspiration. None of them would have considered themselves worthy of great honor or praise, by their own choosing, they made their lives small, but in doing so, left legacies so large, they're difficult to measure. In the eulogy for Margaret Harry, the Archbishop of New Orleans remembered the words of a child who was asked to define a saint. The child looked up at the figures in the stained glass and said, I think that a saint is one who lets the light shine through. This program is made possible by the Archdiocese of New Orleans, the Catholic Cultural Heritage Center, the Catholic Foundation of Greater New Orleans, Catholic Journeys, and the Willwoods Community. DVD copies of Ordinary People, Extraordinary Gifts, The Road to Sainthood are available from WLAE for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, please call 504-830-3717 or visit our website at wlae.com.